Welcome to today's session. So today I'll be going through practical practical six and seven. Last year's practical six and seven. So practical six basically talks about creating just a basic class with no operator overloading engineering programming. And then practical seven, that's when it introduces operator of loading and gener generic programming. That's when you actually have to apply it. <clears throat> so I decided to just do this from scratch. I feel like it's best that way, instead of just create doing the memorandum for practical seven. I'll just, I'll just uh, separate them so that you get to get a clear picture of what's going on. So I'm going to create a project, C++ project, and then I'm going to call it computer science 1B prec 6 2022. Memo, and then next, and then this K, and then view, Manage and double click so that they can see my main function. So before we start, I'm going to explain a bit about the C++ program, the structure and everything. So the first thing that we have at the top, it's what we call a preprocessor directive preprocessor directive. So what the preprocessor directive does, it's it basically it, it it gives us information, it gives the compiler information about the the code, right? The code that, that we're going to be writing. So for example, we are using the hash include the preprocessor directive. So what the hash include preprocessor directive does is that it communicates with the preprocessor, which basically processes before it, it checks. Um, it does it performs the specific task before we process the code or before we compile the code. And compiling code, compiling code basically is in simple terms basically translating from one language to another. That's what compiling does. So, so when you compile, we're basically trying to convert our code into a machine language from one language to another. So from what, what language? From one programming language to, a, to the machine language. So this this is very critical or very important because we might we're gonna have issues when we have to write code if we're writing in the machine using the machine language. Remember the machine language is just zeros and ones. So imagine this is this is how your code would look like. And then you'd have this is how your code would look like. You wanna write for loops in binary, everything in binary. That's the machine language, right? So it would be very, very complicated for us to do that. So we, what we in, in, in instead of doing this, writing it in machine language, we can create sort of like an intermediary language, sort of like a language that can both be understood by us, the user or human beings, and the the the, the computer, because we cannot we cannot. We, we could use English, but we can't because with English, um, a lot of terms, there's one word that can mean a, that can mean like 10 things, but you're using one word and there's like 10 definitions of that word. So it's a, it's sort of like ambiguous. It's, it's, it's not a good, it's not a good language to use. So instead we'd rather use what we call the programming language. So it's important for us to do that so that it makes things easier. You see, this is far better than having to write zeros and ones. 
and I can learn it. It's something that's easy to learn. So, um, okay, let me close this. So, um, well, let me go back to, okay, I wanted to go back here. So instead of having to write this, we write code. We write C++, we write using a specific language. We do all of this, we write using a specific language. So in our choice of language for now, it's C++. So this is, I'm just going to explain what C++ does and how it works. So remember what the preprocessor directive does. There's a hash include. The hash include, it means that include this file because I'm going to use the things that are inside of this file. If you check the file, what does it have? It has a C input, a C in. Um, it is a C in um, standard input object, basically an input, an iStream object. You see, it's of type iStream. It's an iStream object. It's called C in. And then C out, it's a out, standard output stream object of, of type um, O stream. And then we have C air, we have C clog, we have all of them. So that's what the preprocessor does. It's handling that part before we even com compile our code. So that when you try to compile our code, it will recognize, oh, okay, that's what C out means. Oh, I know what an ENDL means because we had the pre we we use the preprocessor directive and you send that information to the preprocessor, which does it, it, as you can see the keyword is pre. It's before what processing, so it's it gets sent to the preprocessor that checks and evaluates and does all of those things before we compile our code. This preprocessor directive that we use is the hash include. So basically it means that include everything that I have defined here inside of this file. So include that file because I'm going to use things that are part of that file. Everything that's inside this file is going to be included in that in there. So that now it knows what I mean by C in. It knows what I mean by C out. It knows all of those things. So that's what it does. And then with this line of code, we are specifying the file. As you can see, it's IO stream, input output stream. That's the name of the file that I'm that I want to include. So why did I use greater than and less than symbols here to include the file? So I did this so that it starts looking in the. You can also do it like this. It will still work perfectly fine. If you check here, I can still write it like this. Let me comment out this line. There we go. It should it's going to run perfectly fine. There we go. It runs. It executes. So. What's the difference between uh, the, the double quotation marks and these two symbols, greater than less than symbol? So with the first one, this one, the part where you put hash, um, greater than and less than symbols, what it does, it looks in the standard library first. What is the standard library? Basically, um, the library that includes everything that we need to work, to, that we need to write C++ code. It starts there, which is perfectly fine because that's where the IO stream is located. It's inside the standard library. So it's going to start looking for that file there, which is perfect because I don't want it to waste time by starting, by locating, trying to locate the file inside of my project of which it's not there. It's going to waste the necessary time. So what it does is that it's, it only starts with the standard library. And then it's what well, if it doesn't find it in standard library, it starts looking for it in your code, in your project structure. What is your project structure? You see, when you create the project that have created this file, this folder, it starts looking for it, it, it goes to look for it here if it failed to find it in the standard library. That's the first part. And then when you use double codes, what it does, it starts in your project structure. It starts, it starts here. And then if it does it fail to find it, it's going to go to the standard library, which is the library that includes everything that, that we need to work with C++ code, which is fine because, um, which is, which is, it's okay because it's still going to work because at the end of the day, it's going to find IO stream, but it depends on the approach that you use. So I suggest you use this when you're including project, when you're including files from the standard library, basically the things that 
C++ gave you to work with. That's that's when you should use the these two symbols. If you define your own, for example, you create your own header file, that's you should use the double quotes so that it starts in your folder, in your project structure or in your project folder before it goes to the standard library because it's not there in the standard library. You've defined it. You've created your own header file. So after it is processed out of this, it's, it's sent to the preprocessor. We come to the part of using names, standard namespace. What does that mean? If you check, I did include the file, right? But I also need to state where it's coming from. If you check, um, it's coming from this standard namespace. What is a standard namespace? Namespace is basically a toolbox. So I need I'm, I'm writing this line of code so that I, I avoid stating which toolbox I'm using, which tool from which toolbox am I using. So instead of me having to write this every time, I just need I just leave out this this standard and the scope resolution operator. So I only specify that I want that tool. So what the namespace does, like a toolbox where you put in all of your tools, you define all the tools that you're going to use. So the tools that are defined for us, it's the things like ANDL, um, C out, console output, for outputting information to the console or the terminal. All of those things, those are the tools that are defined for us. So if you don't say using namespace standard, you would have to keep doing this every time you use a tool that's inside the, the standard namespace. So those are all the tools that are inside the standard namespace and we need to use them. So we need to specify, when you use them, we need to specify where is it coming from. So in order for me to avoid specifying where it's coming from, I just write this one line using namespace standard. Now I can omit this and then just use the tool. What tool do I want to use? I want to use Cout. What tool do I want to use? I want to use um, ENDL or endline. So that's what that's what it's mainly for. Then we have the main function. So the main function it serves as an entry point. So basically, when you run your C++ program, what it does it it looks for a main function. That's it only executes code inside the main function. So if you if you don't define the main function, it won't execute. Your program won't run. Whatever beautiful code you wrote, whatever information wrote, it won't run without the main. It needs a main to run. It's a, it serves as an entry point. That's where entry point means basically means that it starts there. That's where it starts executing. It goes straight to the main. That's what I mean by it serves as an entry point. It goes straight to the main function. Then when we're done, the last part is the return zero. Return zero, zero means success. It means that everything was successful and you should terminate. So zero means everything was successful and you should what? Terminate the program. You should terminate the program. Basically stop the program. That's what the return zero does. You don't have to explicitly type it. There's two ways you can do it. You can explicitly type it there and say return zero, or you can implicitly call it. So I can leave it like this and it's going to work perfectly fine. Nothing is wrong. It's going to put it for me. So it's going to be, this is a this is an implicit way, as you can see, it returns zero. So implicitly, it's going to put it there for me. So I, I can do it in one of the two ways. So for me, I'm just going to leave it there and do it that way. And then. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So now let's explain types, right? Let's let's look at types. So we have two types. We have uh, what do you call? I like, I'm going to use the Java term for it. It's primitive types. So primitive types. Um, these are the types or data types that come with the programming language. So these are the, in C++, these are your ints, 
your white character, your character or your char, um, and then your string, your double, your float. These are all the types and etc. So these are the all all the primitive types, the types that come with the language. They just come with the language. You are given these data types. Then we have what we call user defined types. So these are defined types, it's self-explanatory. These are the types defined, defined or created by the user. And to create these types, you're going to need these few keywords. You're going to need, for example, struct keyword. You're going to need type def keyword. You're going to need um, class keyword. You can use any of those keywords to define your own type. By user, we mean the programmer. That's the term of the person using the programming language, right? It's called the programmer. So that's the user. So that's something to take note of. So user defined. So these are the two types. It's still data types. Both of them are data types. Both of them are data types. So since both of them are data types, they should do exactly the same thing, right? The only difference is that with user defined type, types, they're a bit more complex. So for example, I want to define the person data type. A person is an object, right? So it's something that's a bit that's a bit more complicated than just a normal integer. So I had to def I have to define that type and specify what traits a person has and things like that, etc. So that's the that's the user defined types and the primitive types. Then why do we have struct and class? Okay, let's look at struct and class. So with structs, right, or record structures, let's say I wanted to create a person type, right? I'm gonna call it person. That's the data type I want to define. How do I know I'm defining a type? Because I'm using the keyword struct to create my own data type. Oh, I can say class to create a class. I can do that. Why do we have a struct and a class? A class is basically a an improved version of a structure. A class is basically struct 2.0. That's a class. It does exactly the same thing that a struct does, but with extra functionality. So this you can this you can view it as like a quid. Do you know the car quid? They can view it as that car. And then a person we can say it's a McLaren, the class. So that's the difference between a struct and a class. It's two, they they can do the same thing, but this car there's less functional, way less functionalities compared to this. And McLaren is way more functionalities. You can do more, better to, you can do the things even better that the uh, quid can do. So it's the it's the same thing. So it's 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 both of them are you can say both of them are structures, but then one structure is more advanced than the other. Why do you, why did they have to create this class? Because I mean, think about it in in the programming world, things are always evolving. There's new concepts like object oriented programming. There's concepts like that. So they needed to accommodate to, to add that feature to the programming language, improve the programming language by adding object oriented programming. So and at the end of the day, remember that C is basically C with classes. That's C. If you check the name C, it's actually it's actually using a post increment post increment operator post increment if you remember plus plus it's using that post increment 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 so if you remove if you separate them you see it's saying take c and then add 
plus plus so add extra features what are those features it was classes um exception handling generic uh, programming using templates etc it was all of those things so that's 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 the main reason why classes were introduced but then classes at the end of the day it's the same as the record structure the only difference is that a record structure was mainly meant for it's actually mainly meant for data that's the record structure it's meant for data with the class you can represent both data and behavior by data data i mean variables that's data you remember that when you get data from the user you store it in what variables and then behavior is what functions how an object functions how does it function? So you, that's where you define its behavior. How does a person function? A person can breathe. You can have a breathe function. A person can eat. You can have an eat function. A person can dance. You can have a dance function. A person can jump. You can have a jump function, etc. That's the behavior. And then data, you can have a person's age. How old is the person? A person's height. A person's preferences. A person's parents you can have all of that that's the data those are your variables so that's that's the key difference between these two things and then with classes remember that you can use operator overloading and another thing is that with record structures you everything by default is public so if i was to say coordinate something like this and then I say int x int y by default in everything in a record structure is public so they had to improve that which is for for, sa for safety reasons security reasons just like when you go inside inside your banking app you can't change that your bank balance right because you're only having access to the copy via an accessor function so you do, by default it's private so let's check let me define traits of a person i'm just gonna say age you see i've used it the exact same way as a record structure let's see what happens so let's say let's say i'm creating a coordinate right um coord and then coord.x you see it's green when it's basically when you see the green color there it means that it's public just keep that in mind it's public so if it's public that means i can green means go right if you look at the robots green means go and then um red means don't go so just keep that in mind. So this is going to work perfectly fine with no issues. So I'm going to say C out and then coord.x and then in line character. And then coord.y and line. There we go. And then I'm just going to say x is equals to then i'm going to say y is equals to and then this should work perfectly fine there we go x is equals to 100 y is equals to 120. right so since since it's like this the problem with this with regular structures i can change the value so i can just go there and say dot x is equals to 90. And then I just output it the same way. As you can see, it changed from 100 to a 90. Some might, not, some might say, OK, that's fine, though. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. OK, let's see if it's still fine. Let's say I was creating a client, like a structure, to represent a client for a bank. And then we store the pin and we store the bank. Store the card number. 
So we're going to need a long, and then I'm going to use modify, the long modifier and say long, long int. But you can just abbreviate that and use, and use, um, okay, it's going to complain because I don't, I no longer have this. You can leave it as long, long int. Remember, the long is just a modifier. Modifier meaning that it's modifying the current thing. So long, long is a modifier for integers. It means that I'm increasing the range. So by default, int is what? 32 bits or four bytes. That's integer, right? So if I say long int, so long int means that make the, the integer longer or make it long. By making it long, it usually doubles. So it's going to be 64 bits, which is um, eight bytes. It, it it multiplies it by two. And then you can also make it even longer. So long, long int, and then say, now it becomes, it multiplies by two. Remember, this times two is 128, 128 bits, bits or binary digits. Binary digits are at zeros and ones. And then in bytes, how would it, how much would it be? It would be this times two, which is 16. This will be 16 bytes. But you can omit the integer. Basically, you can leave out the integer like this. Because at the end of the day, the compiler, it knows that it translates long modifiers to an integer. It knows that the long, long, is, the long is basically a different type of an integer. So you don't have to keep saying, no, make the long, a long int or a long, long int. You don't need to explicitly state, state it. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to need this because remember, bank card is, is very long. So <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> I, it's very long. The, very, the bank, pay, bank card number is very long. No pun intended. So we're going to need long, long int. But I'm going to omit the integer because I already, it, I, I don't want to, I want to save it time. I don't want it to, I don't want to save myself time too. I don't want to put unnecessary things and show some level of understanding. So we have that. So we have a client, right? So let me say I create a client, client one, and then I say client one dot cut number, right? And then let's say it's going to be all fours, right? But I want, for the sake of readability, I'm going to put this um, single quote just for making it for making it to be a bit more readable and then i'm gonna have client one dot pin is equals to let's say three thousand right so this is the client's pin okay it won't show anything because i didn't display anything so i need to say client one dot cut number and line then client one dot pin and line there we go so we have this and then it should display now as you can see it's working and then the problem with this is that someone can just anyone can change remember that this is public anyone can change i can come here i'm i'm not i don't even know this person but since it's public, I can get their details on Google and then I change the, their pin. And then now they have to call the bank and tell them I'm locked out of the banking app. It says incorrect pin and this and that because of a flaw in your design. You didn't design the code properly. As you can see, you see, I was able to change the pin. And that shouldn't be something someone can do without the right authorities. So yeah, the pin should be private. It should be only accessible by you or changed by you, not if, not someone outside of, not basically it's not someone who's foreign, who's, who's, not, who's not part of the, who's not part of the agreement that you had with the bank. You went there and you opened a bank, bank, uh, bank account, right? That person was not there. That's an external, party that was it was the that party was not involved that at that time when you were creating the bank 
the bank uh, card. So the beauty with classes, right? By default, everything is private. Then you can state what should be public. So let's test that out. Let's create a person object. So person one like this, and then person one dot come on person one dot what is this dot age right i don't know why isn't highlighting but it should be complaining you see int what what age um is private within this context so it is private by private means that you don't not you don't have access to it you don't have authority to to access this value so that's the nice thing about a class which is good because we'd want for example things like the cut number the bank pin to be okay the cut number should be private you don't have access to you can't change the cut number that should so that should be something that the bank gives you then you're going to have a pin that you, that can be public you can change that it's fine but then no it's not this private but you have public access to it you know by basically it means that no one else can know your pin except you but you also have the functionality to change the pin so since you have the functionality to change the pin um you can change the pin so that's the another advantage of a class by default everything is private and you can also state what's public by using public what is this access control labels which are your public private and protected you can put these labels or these keywords to, to state to state whatever information comes after this colon is going to be it's going to have that level of access the user is going to have that level of access. So just keep that in mind. That's the advantages of a class. We need a class. And you remember what it said, a class, you can have data and behavior. So I can also have void, change, age. You can have functions too. Data and behavior. So we have that, we are done. So now we're going to start with the project. So let's do that. So create a matrix 2D class. So in order for me to create the class, I'm not going to create it here inside this file. I'm going to apply the concept called abstraction. Abstraction means that you are keeping the logical properties separate from the implementation details. So what does that mean? So it means that my when I declare this, this these things that I'm going to use, I'm going to declare them separately and implement them separately. So write the code for it to in order for it. For example, I'm going to create a function separately and then implement the function in a separate file. So that's like abstraction. The logical properties are kept separate from the implementation details. So this is you create class matrix 2D class, right? There we go. Matrix 2D class. And then you should be able to manage a dynamically allocated two dimensional array of integers. So let's create the two dimensional array of integers. So I can remember that by default, everything is private. I can, in theory, I can just declare variables and then leave it there, but I'm going to put labels. Remember that I'm going to sp uh, specify what's going to be public. So I, I might as well also put the label to specify that this is this information is private. So by default, remember that the data, by default, the data should be private. Data should be private. So we need to create a two-dimensional array of, 
of integers, right? Of integer values. You see, integer array. So how do we create this dynamically allocated? Dynamically allocated means that we don't know the size like we'd normally do with, with other arrays. Remember with other arrays, with the, there's the dynamic arrays and the, um, the fixed arrays, fixed size array. A fixed size array, we know the, uh, with the, the array size beforehand, so I can just declare it as a normal array. But then since I don't know how big each dimension is going to be, I'm going to leave it like this. So remember that each pointer, it defines a dimension. So this defines a dimension, and then this pointer defines another dimension. So one, two pointers define two dimensional array or a 2D or a two dimension. And then I'm going to need constructors, right? So I'm going to need constructors. So what are constructors? Constructors are builders. That's all they are. So we're going to have tif different types of builders. This builder is going to be a builder who doesn't take in any requirements from the user. So the user doesn't care how you're going to build the object. They just want the object. So since they just want the object, I'm not going to take in any parameters. That's what this constructor does or th that builder does. This is a no args constructor. Or, or no arguments or default constructor. By default, it means that if you don't provide the, the information, this is the def this is the default constructor that will be called or invoked. So that's it. For example, you're building a house, right? When you're building a house, you can get information from the user. For example, how wide did they want the house to be? or how high do they want the house to be? Do they want it to be a double story, triple story, whatever? Those are the inputs that you get. Those are your arguments. So we, we are not getting those arguments from the user. We are, define, we are defining basically different types of builders to accommodate different types of users to meet the different needs of users. Some users might not care how their house looks like. They might not, they might not care at all. They just want the house. You might paint it pink, ex exteriors pink, interiors white. They don't care. They just want the house. I don't know who would want that, but yeah. I mean, to some people do. If you check, some people just need a house. They just buy. They don't care. They just get the defaults. For example, when you go to property 24, for example, you want to buy property. When you check the, it's, it's defaults, right? You didn't decide. How that how, how that house would look. You are not part of the plan, or you're not part of you're not you're not involved in the creation of that object. You didn't tell the builders, okay, you want this and that and that. You want to fit it in kitchen unit and things like that. You didn't give them all those details. You just wanted the house. So that's what this builder is, or what that builder does. Then you're gonna have a different type of builder. This builder is going to take in the requirements. This is what we call a parameterized constructor. This is the different, this is a different type of builder. This builder is going to take in the requirements. What do you want? How big do you want the house? So basically the rows and columns, those are the first two integers. How big do you want the house to be? How wide and how high? Rows and columns. And then we're going to take in int value. The third int is for the default value for each for each integer in the, and, and, and the underlying array. So if you check each integer, so remember the two-dimensional array. And two-dimensional, it means that the coordinate is in XY format, just like a Cartesian plane. If you remember a Cartesian plane in mathematics, you have your X and Y coordinate. And then use those two values to get um, to get us to get one integer back. So that's in essence that's that's what's happening here. We're going to take in the number of rows, or how wide do you want our x axis to be? It depends on how you've structured. You I don't know whether your rows are your x axis or your rows are your y axis. It depends on how you want to structure it. But let's pretend our rows are x axis. 
So it means that how, how wide would you want your x axis to be? And then let's say for example, row columns represents how high you want your y axis to be. So the height and the width, you can define it like that using that concept. So this is going to be your x, y in rows and columns to represent your x and y's. And then the int value, that's the int, that specific coordinate. So if you remember your functions, for example, f of x, what is x? So we're working with two dimension of f of x. And then sometimes you can just have f of x and y can have like this x and y. So it's the same concept. So it's going to take in the number of rows and columns. How how wide and how high do you want the object to be? Remember, it's a matrix. It's a matrix, so it's two di it's two D. There's rows and columns. Then we have the value, the default value at every single coordinate, x y coordinate. Then we're going to have a different type of builder. This is the last builder. This is what we call a copy constructor. It's going to help build the object, but this builder is, is sort of is somewhat a lazy builder. He's very lazy. What this one does is just going to copy what someone else did. So that's why it's called a copy constructor. So that's what this one does. So the input is going to take it's another matrix 2D. It's an object. It's a matrix 2D object that is going to take and copy the, the, the work that someone else did to make that object. But then there is a problem with doing this. You don't want to take it by value. When you, when you put it, when you pass it like this, it's a problem. You're taking it by value. So let's say you are, let's say you're trying to download. By value means that by its actual values, like if it's 20 gigs, you're gonna take, you're gonna try to save all that, the whole thing, the whole 20 gig file, try and save it exactly as it is. Or you can choose a different approach. To, to make things faster, to speed up the process. You can go to where that file is located. So you go to that address instead of getting the all the all the files as they are. So for example, an example of this, right, of getting an address is, for example, I say if uj.ac.z. You see, this is the address. I'm not getting the, the value. So I'm not getting all of this, the code and everything. I get, Remember that the code is that we can in, in this example we can view the code as the value. I'm not getting the value. It's going to be very slow because I'd have to download every every code that that, that has been written here. I'd have to do that, and that's going to cost you a lot. It's going to cost you memory or space. It's going to cost you those those things, and you don't want to do that. So in in instead of doing that, you get it by address. You get the address of where this object is located in memory. Wherever it's located, I don't care. Just get me the address. I'll go there myself instead of downloading the whole thing. So for example, instead of me downloading a movie, I'll just go to flickstore.video. Instead of me downloading the movie, I'll go to this address and then and then watch, search for a movie that I'm looking for. I want this movie. I go to that address. You see, I'm not playing, I'm not downloading the movie. I'm going to where it's located to the address. And you see how fast it is. It's very fast. I didn't waste any time. I can start watching immediately. Instead of having to wait for it to download the whole thing, and the movie could be, could be five gigs of space. Especially if it's like 1080p or 2K resolution or 4K resolution, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to be a very big file, like 8 gig, 10 gig. So you don't want to do that. You want to just pass it by address. And then what, when you're making this copy, remember what, it, what the term copy means. You're just making a copy of the original, right? It's like, for example, you go to a printer, you take a document, you print it, you make a copy of that document. Do you change the original? No, you don't. So since I'm not going to change the original, um, well, when I'm doing the copying, I need to put the keyword const. Const means that it's constant. It's not going to be changed. It's unchangeable. So we are done doing that. You don't have to worry about extra other things. 
And some might ask, okay, why do I just have int, 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 and I don't specify, for example, int rows? Because in my header file, I don't write code. I don't implement. I just put logical properties. Or we can some, we can, or you can call it function signatures. This is just a signature. If you go back to your slides, it explains what a function signature is. I can write it like this, and it won't show me any. It's won't, it won't show me any issues. Then I'm going to create what I call a destructor using the tilde character or the tilde or yeah, character, and it's going to be called matrix to the like this. So what the destructor does, the destructor or the destroyer. The destroyer, you can think about it, think of it in the sense of the demolition team. So they come to demolish the object when it's no longer in use. So for example, they say, okay, this person moved out of this house, it's stranded now, it's no longer being used. It, it wasn't even sold. So no one owns it, it's just there sitting in memory. It's wasting up memory or land. It's wasting up the land, so we need to de destroy it and make space or make more land so that other people can create, right? So that's what the, 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 the destructor does. It goes there to clean an object or destroy an object when it's no longer being used. So we did that. We are done creating. So we're done up until here. So now we need to create accesses for rows, columns, and everything. Before I do that, I need to create variables to store my rows and columns. So I'm going to have int row, underscore rows and underscore columns. I'm going to write it like this because C++ allows me to do so. So this is a very good feature. It should normalize using it. Because, so for example, I can say int A and I can say int B, or I can just write it in short and say int A B like this. Nothing. It's complaining because I declared it twice, but as you can see, nothing happens. It's it's a short. It's the shorthand of creating something. If something is of the same type, you can define it more than once by creating it separated by a comma, and you can even initialize them, give them default default values, and say it's equals to ten, it's equals to hundred. You can do that as long as you separate by separate it with the comma. It creates these integers and they must be of the same type in order for you to do that. I can't say I want this. This should be an in pointer, but I'm creating it like this. It's going to be created as an integer, so you just make sure they're of the same type. So as I've noticed here, they are of the same type, so I can just create it like create them, create them like that. So what's next? You need to create accesses. So remember, by default, everything is private, cannot be accessed. So in order for me to allow the user to access it, I create what we call an accessor. That means you can only access. So you can only access the information. You cannot change it. You can only access, right? And then you're going to have a mutator. That means you can, you can only mutate or change the values. So let's create accessors. Let's see what accessors they want us to create. The number of rows, columns, and individual values. So rows, columns, and individual values. So how do we do that? So in a way, accessors, it's like we are redeclaring a variable. Just think about it in that sense. How, for example, you'd create rows like this, right? But then now you are creating a function. So you'd call it int and then you prefix putting, you put a prefix called get. As you can see, when the moment I type get, it shows me the other pre installed functions defined in C. So as you can see, I'm following the right coding convention. So I'm following the right rules for coding in C. As you can see, it's similar to other functions that were created by the author and the C++ team. So I'm going to call it get, and then as you can see, another thing to note is everything is in small letters. So I'm, ju I'm just going to follow the, follow the same coding convention. So I'm going to call it get rows like this. 
as you can see, this is a, see, ex exactly identical lines of code. The only difference is that I put these round brackets there to show to signify that this is a function. Because remember that I'm gonna they're gonna access these variables or these private variables via vi private member variables via the accessors or accessor functions or accessor methods, however you want to put it. But then remember that you, are, you can only access. How do I put that restriction for them to only access? By putting a suffix const. Const is very important when it comes to the way you can manipulate data. It's very important. So you can put const there. So int get rows const. There we go, done. Then I do the same thing for my columns. The only difference is that now it's no longer called get rows, it's called get calls. Then I create another one for getting the value. So get value, there we go. And then with the get value, I'm trying to get a value. Remember that I said we should look at it in the sense of a Cartesian plane. Remember Cartesian plane to get a specific value, you must specify an X and Y values, right? You must specify those two values. So I also need to specify them here. So I need to take in int, int. So I need to take in int x and y, but it's going to be a row and column. That's Those are the two things that I'm taking in. But remember, I'm not going to implement anything here. This is a header file. So I'm going to leave it like this. I'm not going to implement anything there. And then now we need to create um, mutators for changing the underlying values in the array by way of their row and column value. So they even gave in giving you the answer there. So we need to create a setter for the array for the values, right? Mutators, the way they work is that you always use the return data type void is the return type for the function, the void data type. Because void means that I'm not going to get back anything. And it's not meant to get back anything because I'm not what accessing. I'm not accessing. I'm just changing the data. So it's the every mutator, you, you prefix it with the set keyword. And as you can see, these are things pre-installed or predefined in C++. So I'm still on the right track. I'm following good coding conventions. And as you can see, everything is in small letters. So I must do the same thing to, to, to follow in the footsteps of the authors of the language. So set value. Then it must take in three things. One, a row or X coordinate. And, and the next thing is a column or Y coordinate. And the value that, I'm, that I want to set it to. And another thing to keep note, you shouldn't put const at the end. If you put const at the end, in a way you're saying you shouldn't change anything and it's not necessary. Yeah, you shouldn't change anything. Yeah, you shouldn't put it there because it's gonna prevent you from mutating the data or from changing the data. But remember the main goal of a, of a mutator is to change the data or to mutate the data. Mutate is like a fancy way of saying change. It's meant to change the data in simple terms. Then we're going to have a two string function which does not have any parameters and returns a string. So we're going to have a two string function. Before I use a string, I need to include it because yeah, it's it's a it's a very complex data type, so it has its own file. You can check it out. This is the string file. This is how it looks. This is how they've defined the string. So we can work with that and then now I can start creating the function. So it's a string, but remember that it's in the standard namespace. So and since I'm not going to code inside of my header file, I'm not going to say using namespace std. I'm not going to do that because I'm not coding in the header file. And this is the only time I use the standard namespace. So it's not necessary for me to say using namespace standard. 
So I'm going to put it there and then do that. And then space and then I'm going to say to string. And then remember that it's mainly it's only meant to return a string that representation of the matrix. So I'm going to put a const at the end to make sure that it's it doesn't change the underlying data. It's only meant to give you a, a string representation of the data or of the matrix. So we are done creating our simple class. Now what's left is to define constants and a helper function. So let's create the helper function first. So enforce range. It's going to take in three integers. The, the, lower, oh, the lower bound, upper bound, and the value that we're checking for, for that range. To ch the value we're checking if it's within that lower and upper bound. Then we're going to have put const keyword at the end to make sure that it doesn't change anything. It's only meant to enforce the range. And then remember that we have a default or no args constructor, so I need to define constants for it. I need to create class constants for it. So remember how we create, a, we create constants. The const keyword, very important const int followed by the data type of the constant. Remember my my rows and my columns are integers. And the value in, the, in each XY coordinate is also an integer. So I'm going to use int a lot. So default underscore rows. I'm just going to make it 25 by 25. And then const int default underscore calls is equals to 25. And then const int default value the default value um just make it zero nothing fancy and then i'm also gonna i'm also gonna need the mean value the starting point of my, basically my rows and columns i don't want them to exceed the specific range and then i'm just gonna say hundred thousand can be any value, doesn't really matter. So there they are, these are my class constants. So these are what, what it's called class constants. We're gonna need those constants. And constant, you know what a constant is, right? For example, pi. You can't miraculously change that and say, nah, it's no longer 3.14, it's now 3.19, because I feel like it, I feel so. I'm just in the mood of changing it. You can't do that, it's a constant. So that's what the key keyword const does. So in, you, and you also need to specify the data type of that constant. And you, put, you need to put it in all caps to denote that it's not gonna change. It's constant, you see, it's the same, it's the same um, case. Usually it's uppercase, you don't make it lowercase because remember the C++ is data type, so keywords are in lowercase. So to avoid that, you should put it. You should put it in uppercase. The problem, something is missing here. The problem with this is that if I leave it like this, every time I create a matrix 2D instance, every instance is going to have its own copy of this, which is going to be a waste of time. So, for example, we don't want to be doing that. So, for example, a piggy bank. Let me make an example of this using a piggy bank. So for example, if you look at the piggy bank, right? It's for you to put your savings, right? This cute little thing for you to put your savings. So the what's really happening with constants that I've defined right now, it's like every, let's say, let's say for example, you are the first born at that moment, right? And then there comes a newborn. Then that newborn, they also, when that when your when your sibling is a is of a reasonable age, they give they give they give him or her a a thing a piggy bank, a different and it's the exact same color same shape same size same everything. They give it the very same the same piggy bank, but you also have a piggy bank. So with the concept, and then whenever whenever you have another sibling. A third child, they're also gonna get this very same thing, the same color, same size, same everything. 
so the concept, the, the thing that I'm trying to raise, the point that I'm trying to raise is that why don't you, instead of wasting money, in terms of real world, we are wasting money, but in terms of computer, we are wasting resources, we are wasting space. Instead of me wasting space, each person gets their own piggy bank. We buy one piggy bank and we share it. That's what I'm trying to, the point that I was trying to make. So how do we share it? I put the keyword static at, at the beginning. So make a static what? Const. That's what I'm doing. Static means shared. To be fair, they should have used the word shared, like the keyword shared. It would make much more sense. But yeah, just know static means shared. So it's a shared constant. So shared static meaning shared. And then I'm just going to do this for all the constants. So now instead of us having to having to to having to like keep buying the same thing for for keep buying the same thing we just use one thing and share one piggy bank because it's the exact same thing same color same it's the same thing we all all of us are going to use the same thing so there's no need for us to do all of that and buy waste money in terms of computer you're wasting space we don't want to waste resources and we're going to need an enum to define the status of our application so with an enum i suggest you use it you create it in all caps like this in uppercase because why because some the type that you have you might it might be in conflict with the type that you might have defined let's say for example i had a class called status then I try to define this as status, but this is a different status. It's a status for my program. You see, now there's conflict. So the best thing to just do from now, just make your enum in uppercase. Always. Your enum should be in uppercase. You never have these issues again. And then I'm going to define error range, and then say negative one, and then success. Remember that an enum by default starts um, it starts from zero and then it increments by one. So this would be zero and then this would be one because from one from zero to one it's zero plus one is one. So that's why. So I'm but now I'm gonna make it start at negative one because I want this success to be zero. So if this starts at negative one and then at every time every time you add a new constant it adds one this means this one's going to be minus one plus one which is zero and where did we see zero we saw it inside main i want, I want i'm going to put it here so i'm going to use the success constant to represent you see my program has better meaning so return success remember what i said zero means that the program was successful and we should terminate the program because it was successful that's what zero means so that I, I don't face those errors, I'm going to hash include matrix 2D.h. And I'm using double quotes so that it starts looking for the header file inside of my project. As you can see, there it is. There's matrix 2D.h. It starts in my project structure or my folder, project folder, and then it finds it immediately without wasting time. I don't want it. I can use the these symbols, but the problem is that it's going to start to looking for it in the standard library. And the C++ standard library, just think about it, it's very big. It's very big. So you don't want to waste all that time looking for that file where you, where you know it's not going to be there. So you should use um, double quotes. And then that should be fine. Mm, that should be fine. Let me check something here. It's already an hour, so I should end the session and then make part two. So yeah, we have this so far. I'm just gonna stop the recording here and then we're gonna I'm gonna see you in part two. So let me end the recording here. Then we'll continue in part two.